As the build-up to the referendum later this year continues, joining me now is a Sydney barrister and lecturer in constitutional law, Gray Connolly. Gray, appreciate your time this afternoon. I enjoyed your analysis in the Sydney Morning Herald recently, uh, your, your uh, column which basically, I think, gets to the nub of some of the concerns around the wording of the amendment. And you wrote in the paper... In simple terms, the elected parliament's lawmaking power in section, in section 3 is subject to and confined by the voice's represent, representational power in Section 2. Can you explain to our viewers what you mean by that? OK, so in simple terms, our constitution is divided into chapters, and each of the chapters do things in the polity that the constitution creates. So our constitution literally constitutes the Commonwealth of Australia. And it divides the powers of the Commonwealth in Chapter 1. It allots those to the Parliament in Chapter 2. It allots those to the Crown and the Executive Government. And in Chapter 3, it allots them to the courts. The voice alteration will create a new Chapter 9. And it will, in particular, in the new Section 129, Roman 2, create a power in the voice to make representations to the Parliament and to the Executive Government. So it will create a form of representational power. The Parliament will not have the capacity to limit that representational power simply because the Parliament's powers in the Roman Three are stated to be subject to this Constitution. Well, what else is in the Constitution to which the Parliament's power will be subject? The representational power in Roman Two. So, in a sense, the problem with the Section 129 model is that it is subjecting the Parliament's powers to make laws to the voice's constitutional existence and the voice's constitutionally entrenched power to make representations. And it is simply mm. something that you can read in the plain words there. You, you do not have to be a, even a lawyer. You just have to be an interested lay person who understands the English language yeah. to see the problem. Mm. Well, and, and this is what you, you said, that the voice will have only... Uh, that the voice will only have a very narrow mandate compared to the elected parliament does not matter and cannot matter to a high court which must adjudicate the Constitution's plain words, which is basically what you're detailing there. Yes. So it's it's just ridiculous to, for me to see someone saying that the Constitution is going to be amended, something we do very rarely. It's going to add a whole new chapter in Chapter 9. And there are serious people who are asking you to believe, I think unseriously, that an addition of a new chapter to the Constitution will not change much of how the High Court understands the Constitution. It's simply ridiculous. Adding a whole new chapter to the Constitution is being done for a reason. The High Court's job is to apply the Constitution as it is. Even the most black-letter lawyer, of which I am one, would be required to give the fullest uh, operation to the voice because it is contained in its own new chapter. It is in its own new chapter in the way that the Parliament is in Chapter yeah. 1, the Crown and the Executive is in Chapter 2, and the, and the Courts are in Chapter 3. And this week, you know, your analysis is timely. It comes at, uh, alongside Julian Lees's intervention this week. He's going to move amendments in the Parliament to try and fix the problem you're talking about, Gray. And at the same time, we see these opinion polls which show a softening in the majority. And, and you say if supporters of a voice, of which I am one, you support the voice want to increase support for this voice model, especially among conservatives, then changes must be made. However, Gray, it looks to me, I spoke to one of the, the campaign director of the Yes campaign earlier, the messages out of the government seem to suggest that they're not, they're not open to budging despite this collapse in support since Christmas. Well, I, I am not a pollster, but in my lifetime, no proposal for constitutional change ever got more popular with time. I find it strange that someone like Julian Lisa, who has acted in the utmost good faith to the point where he's really hurt his political career, and I say this, Julian is a lifelong friend of mine, and Julian, Julian's really risked his political career to do the right thing in his mind to try and advance the prospects of a voice succeeding. And for the government simply to rebuff Julian or to rebuff good faith conservatives like myself, who are trying to help the voice reach a national majority and in a majority of states such that it would be it would pass, to just reject that is, to me, an abdication of the responsibilities that the government and the parliament have, both from the people themselves and what is expected of them by our constitution. Mm. Yeah. And 
And, uh, you know, w w you and I have spoken privately about this, the representations of Father Frank Brennan, um, a respected lawyer, Indigenous advocate, someone that wants the voice to get up. You've got that representation from Julian Lisa that you spoke about, others like Greg Craven. And I think you make the point, it's almost tragic, though, in its, uh, in its prediction, but you say if it fails, the yes advocates cannot complain they were not warned about some of these legitimate fears. Yes, I, I just cannot believe that, that this is not being engaged with more seriously. You have a large chunk of conservative people who actually want to have I have a voice or something like it. And I would remind people watching, it was the Conservatives who pushed the 1967 referendum through. It was actually William Charles Wentworth IV, who was uh, a Menzies minister, who was an agitator for Aboriginal rights. The idea that the right of politics has been the problem here all along is just not the case. Often it's been the right of politics that's been pushing through these things. And I would remind people who disagree with this is that great reforms are often an inside job in the way that only Nixon could go to China, etc. You need a number of Conservatives to support a change such that normal people who are not particularly political but are very protective of their constitution would feel safe in agreeing to it. And if I can just give one example, the sidelining of the Reverend Father Frank Brennan, uh, a Jesuit priest, one of the most respected Australians by Australians of any politics and none, the sidelining of him in this debate, I think, has been absolutely disgraceful. And I would remind people, but for the Brennans, plural, both uh, Sir Gerard Brennan, the former Chief Justice of the High Court, who wrote the leading judgment in Mabo, and Father Frank Brennan, the constitutional lawyer and Jesuit priest, I wonder whether we would even be having this discussion about a voice now. And the sidelining of, of, of Father Frank Brennan has just been appalling, and I think it, it reflects a lot of the way this debate has been conducted as a way to almost shut out people who could help you because... You, you want to sort of get, have the cause run to the, the finish line, even if you lose. And I would ask people who are on the Yes campaign to ponder this. If you wake up the day after the referendum and the, and, and the proposal has been defeated in circumstances where it could have succeeded had you been willing to compromise and listen to other people, how will you ever live with yourself as Australians? Because we share this country together um, and we should not be put in the position where Australians have to either vote against their Indigenous brothers and sisters or vote for a flawed model. And I think everyone needs to take and, a step back and, and yeah. think of the country. Well, and it's not like there's not other options. Like you, you said, uh, we touched on Julian Lees's proposal. You've got Father Frank su suggesting that instead of saying the voice can make representations to the executive, you say ministers of state, therefore you remove any suggestion that public servants might be caught up in the amendment to the constitution, there are ways that can be done. And subsequently, if those that want representations to the executive to be achieved, that can be legislated at a subsequent point. These are very clear alternatives that would empower more people that want to back the voice to vote yes. Yes, indeed. And, and I, I mean, I have a slightly different take from both of Julian and Father Frank. I would actually put their voice in Chapter 2 convened by the Governor-General as effectively an advisor to the Crown because most of the decisions that affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are made in the executive government. So that's where I would put it. But the, the, the point is you have a debate about these things and the, the parliamentary process was ridiculous. You had a few weeks of debate. It was done over the Jewish Passover and Christian Easter period when very few people would have been able to get there to give evidence. I, I still put my hand up. I was not called upon. I know a number of people who are also not called upon. The process was ridiculous, and yet under our constitution, section 128 vests in the parliament the power to authorise the referendum that will go to the people, and the parliament just simply abdicated its responsibilities. And I think this has been such a shambolic process. However it results, it's been such a terrible process, and it sets a terrible precedent for how other governments in future times may wish to push through things that may not have wide support. I just think this has been handled terribly badly and the government of the day and the parliament of today needs to take a step back and think what are we doing and what are we trying to achieve. Barrister and lecturer in constitutional law, Greg Connolly, appreciate your time. Thanks.